topic. And, you know, Mark, because you don't have video today and you have to present differently, I, I decided I'm going to present differently too. So if everyone's okay with it, I'm just going to do the entire thing through um, interpretive dance. And uh, so I won't be talking anymore. I'm just dancing. No, no, I'm just joking. But if you've seen Mark dance, man, that guy can really move. So uh, that's not what I'm going to do, though. I'm going to talk to you about challenging behaviors. And I did a little bit last time. Uh, but I tried to focus it in sort of uh, on, on um, pandemic, remote learning related issues around. Well, no, no. Behaviors. Author. Um, please mute yourselves, guys. Please mute yourselves. Otherwise, we're going to get random dogs barking and all kinds of things. Um, and Mark, you may be able to do that, I think. Um, and we can unmute you when you have questions if you raise your hand. All right, what I'd like to know, and maybe you can just tell me in the chat, is how many of you uh, are new to today, like you're coming and you didn't come last time? So that way I know how much to repeat. So I got one, two, three, four. Lots. Okay, cool. Uh, well, so, so, you know, you missed really an inc the best session I ever did. No, I'm just joking. Um, but I will review a little bit about last time briefly because it sort of flows together. And the part that I'm gonna review, we were talking about challenging behaviors. We focused on a couple things about being at home for kids missing out on things and uh, being cooped up and, and being annoyed. That's sort of in the category of disappointment. Um, and sort of making visual schedules for them so that they have some sense of what they're going to be doing. Um, that a lot of kids probably need somebody sitting with them to do remote learning. And one of your colleagues talked about, uh, and maybe if she's here today, for, you know who it was, Mark, she could put the information in, a, in the chat, but there was a good sort of uh, government uh, um, support uh, I believe it was a state support that might allow people to come to your to people's homes, and maybe one of the things they could do is sort of facilitate being able to kind of sit and, and do uh, work. Um, and there are lots of college kids looking for work, and lots of high school kids looking for work who could kind of sit and and help your kid kind of focus in on an hour or two of remote learning. Um, so uh, we also talked about sort of crisis management, that when people are the Incredible Hulk, we talked about Dr. Banner and the Incredible Hulk. Dr. Banner is your logic brain, which gets hijacked, disappears. No logic when people are really threatened. And for people like that, discipline just doesn't work. Rewards and well, consequences don't work. You can't threaten the Incredible Hulk without getting more Incredible Hulk behavior. The Hulk needs to be soothed. And we talked about distraction as the main crisis tool to soothe somebody in three categories of distraction. Novel items, things they've never seen before that might grab their attention, get their mind off the problem at hand. Or a sensory issue, which could be like a snack, food, it could be taking a walk, could be listening to music or listening to your meditation guide that I shared with you, some of those. Um, it could be um, their special interest. Uh, so, so watching their favorite show, playing their favorite game that can get their mind and uh, off the problem at hand and, and soothe them, right? But then we begin to talk about setting up prevention plans. And that's what I'm going to do with you today. When you know, when you have a repeat problem, you can't just distract people and sort of put out the fire. When you have a repeat problem, you really want to get ahead of it, see it coming. And the best way to see it coming then the best information for setting up a prevention plan is for you to know what triggers it. And so um, I believe, let's see if this is in the next slide. Um, let me see what I've got here. Okay, so a good behavior plan shouldn't be just to reward a child or you know, ignore them or a law system, number three and four of this. That's not really a good behavior plan. The best part of a behavior plan is proactive. Number one, how do you alter the thing that triggers them, right? Maybe it's every kind of writing work that exists or reading, right? Or maybe it's having to wait for something, whatever it might be. 
know what the trigger is, alter those triggers. And then number two, besides modifying triggers, number two is teach a replacement skill, teach a better way to get what you need. Those are the two most important things of a behavior plan. And so uh, you got to know the triggers. I, I've been doing this uh, a fair amount of time. I don't have the, I still don't have the answers to everything. Uh, and I never will. But I'm going to share with you my, as an old man, <laughs> my map of the common triggers. It's right in front of you. This is in my head. I've memorized this. The, I know these triggers and I know a variety of different behavior plans and prevention plans I would put together for each of these categories of triggers. Um, and, and so they include internal issues when a kid is not well, you know, uh, that mean, how do we know that? Well, because everywhere they go, they're having more problems. And so when a kid isn't doing well and they bring more problems everywhere they go, I know for a time, for some time, um, temporary amount of time, I'm going to have to lower the demands I place on that kid, right? So if a kid is having gastroesophageal reflux symptoms uh, or is having severe migraine headaches or dental pain, I can't get the same amount of work out of them and I'm not going to try. We're going to have to back off a little bit. If they're tired, they're going to have to sleep. If they're hungry, we got to feed them. That comes before doing schoolwork. Yeah. I remember working in, in the inner city uh, for about 10 years before I took uh, uh, a very different kind of job. And um, we had a lot of kids who came in and they were hungry and they were tired and we weren't going to get any work done unless they took a quick nap and had a snack. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things we got to look at. Number two, sensory issues. We've got to pay attention to the sensory environment. Our kids on the autism spectrum in particular are highly sensitive to being overwhelmed by stimulation. And I don't know if I put it on, I think I put it on last time, uh, but what, besides just being overwhelmed with sound, uh, you can also be bored, underwhelmed. Kids with ADHD just don't have, they need to get up and move quite a bit. They can't just sit and be talked at like I'm doing with you. But another thing that I think fits into sensory issues is being overwhelmed by other people's emotions. So if you have a classroom, you know, a lot of our kids with autism set each other off. Like if you have issues with sensory, uh, if you have sensory issues, you know, <laughs> what worse place to be around kids who scream and tantrum all the time. And, and that's really what happens. We put all these kids together. And so sometimes we have to be creative about helping kids who are really sensitive to uh, being overwhelmed, uh, give them a chance to get a break, to go to a safety area, to go to a quiet spot when one of their friends is tantruming, right? Same at home when you're cooped up in New York City in an apartment. I grew up in New York City in an apartment and my neighbors were really um, so pleased that I was a drummer uh, and I loved playing basketball on the 10th floor of my apartment with a, a hanger for a net uh, that I shoved into the doorstop. Um, you, you know, uh, it's loud in New York City. And so we need to find ways with noise canceling headphones, other things for kids to get away from that stimulation. Lack of structure. So we know that a lot of our kids with attention issues and language based issues <coughs> are going to be confused and don't know what to do. And so visual supports add a type of structure, visual schedules at home, visual schedules at school. Uh, I remember one of the worst moments I ever had in my life is when I had to do, I was, I was a, you know, behavioral consultant, social skill consultant, but the kindergarten teacher was out one day and they said, Jed, can you watch her class for a couple of hours? That was one of the worst experiences I ever had in my life because one of the tasks I was required to do was get kids to sit in a circle. Now, by the way, I didn't mention to you. These are so-called typically developing kids, okay? Have you ever tried to get kids to sit in a circle? It, it dawned on me after about 20 minutes of struggling that they all needed a visual aid. If you put a mat down and said, this is where I want you to sit, then people can figure it out. So you've got to look carefully at the, are there visual supports in the environments where you are? Um, uh, best uh, you know, another sort of common situation is kids who have language issues and we sit and read a story to them as if they're understanding and comprehending, fully engaging in the story. And they may not be if they have 
uh, auditory processing issues, attention issues, and language issues. And so we may have to have a visual support, a cartoon that backs up the story that a teacher is telling. Um, a, uh, a, uh, inclusion teacher next to the other teacher who is acting out the story in theatrical language. So it's not just words being, um, you know, thrown out uh, at, at little kids who aren't comprehending. Okay. Um, challenging work. We're going to talk about that again. We talked about it last time, but if that's the trigger and what do I mean by challenging work, it could be all schoolwork, every bit of schoolwork, because almost all schoolwork involves like reading or writing in some fashion, okay? And that's gonna be hard for a lot of kids. Um, it could be a fear or a phobia. We talked about fear of COVID last time. We'll talk about other fears and phobias tonight or this afternoon, whatever we call this period of the day. Um, it could be having to wait or not get what you want, a disappointment, you know, a change in schedule that leads to a disappointment. We know that sets off a lot of our kids. So we'll talk about how we teach kids how to wait how we teach kids how to handle disappointment. If you don't get this, there's still something to live for. And the next one is threats to self-esteem. Okay, this means uh, for a lot of kids, if they make a mistake and, uh, and they're corrected, they feel they're stupid, right? If they lose a game, they feel less than, if they're criticized or teased. So we'll talk about ways to uh, help kids cope with those kinds of triggers. And last but not least is unmet wishes for attention. We have some kids who like to get attention all the time. They want to be the center of attention. Um, I have a lot of kids who, you know, want the opposite of that. Um, but kids who need a lot of attention sometimes always don't always do it in the right way. So we're going to show you ways that we sort of teach kids to get attention in, in ways that people actually like them, as opposed to like tweeting horrible things at 3 a.m. because you can't get elected. I'm sorry, that was a joke that's now recorded but I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, so let us, uh, let's take a look. Demands for work, big trigger, right? Hey, by the way, I'm gonna zip through some of this stuff and then I'm gonna shut up and take your questions because the best thing I can do is answer your questions about the issues you're dealing with. So um, let's talk about dealing with difficult work. Uh, before I talk about how do we modify work, right? We always have to modify our work for kids who have uh, learning issues. And then we have to teach them replacement skill, which is really, instead of refusing to do your work, the replacement skill isn't compliance. When I see compliance as part of a behavior plan, well, that's a goal, but that's not a skill. A skill is like asking for help. Um, I'm just looking at the chat to see what people are saying there. I think it's about getting slides. All right, so the skill is being able to sort of try it, ask for help, ask to take a break, negotiate. So before we get into that, let's take a look at this video. This is a video I took from YouTube many years ago. It is a father trying to get his daughter to do a math worksheet on place value. And so there's a decimal point and he says to the girl, after, you know, here's what's in the tenths column right after the decimal place. Here's what's in the hundredths column. And he, the first question he asked her is what's in the thousandth place? When she doesn't know the answer and she freaks out, she starts banging her head. And what I want you to think about is if you're dad, how would you modify this work? And number two, what do we teach her as a replacement skill instead of screaming and banging her head? All right. Now, um, you're going to hear the mom and the daughter in the background filming this. So they say something about a red house. You can just ignore that. What I want you to pay attention to right now is, again, the father. What would you do differently to set this work up differently? And the daughter, what do we teach her? Okay. Come here, Rachel. Come on. Where's your bigger Stop scribbling all over your paper like this. I need to. I need to go into Red House. Okay. Now, there's the dust. Where's Lyra? Okay. Where's the thousands? Lyra. Tens. Hundreds. Where's the thousands? Okay. Oh. Here. here. Look, I'm helping you. Up to Red House. Look. Okay. What's this? I don't know. I've written it, so now you do know. Tell me. This is the chart. I don't know how to play this one. Here you go. What place is 
this. Here's the decimal. What do you call that? What's the answer? Well, I guess the dairy is reading from the chart. Yeah. 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 Come on, get another one. Be quiet. Be quiet now. I could listen to that all day, couldn't you? Uh, and maybe you do listen to that all day. Um, it reminds me of a, a lot of my own students as well as my own children growing up. And in fact, my daughter, I know it's being recorded, but boy, that was her with math. Um, so look, what do we do? How, tell me, put it in your chat, guys. How do you modify this work? What are you gonna do differently? Uh, I'm waiting for your chat, so, so tell me, type it in. What are you gonna do differently? A quiet location, 100% agree. That's a noisy place. Empathy, yeah, don't just keep going through like, ah, you, this is hard stuff. Yeah, use some visual support, 100% agree. How about a label that says, here's the tens, here's the thousands, here's the hundreds, here's the thousands. Um, yep, probably take a break, then try again. Okay, yeah, sure, we can take a break. I, I said last time, it's okay to take a break if somebody's not trying to avoid the work because then a break can just reinforce their rewarding. And, um, and it is okay to take a break anytime, but if kids are trying to avoid work, I'd rather them learn to ask for a break rather than tantrum for a break. So I would say, hey, let, let's take a break. You need a break? Some kids don't know when they need a break and they really do. Um, so uh, here's the deal. Um, I don't know, I think I went through this last time. Uh, we talked about using the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule means giving 80% of really easy work that kids can do well before the 20% that's difficult. Did this dad do that? The first question he says is what's in the thousandth place, right? So um, prior to that, he had said, here's what's in the tenths, here's what's in the hundredths. And the answer is uh, from Kevin is correct. No, he didn't do that. He, he, showed, he gave her the hardest question three three uh, spaces away from the decimal point what's in the thousands place she can't do it so now she's failed and now he literally says to her i've written the answer so just say it and of course she won't because emotionally she's now the incredible haltress she feels bad about herself she just wants to quit she hates she's frustrated so sometimes we have to do what we call errorless learning we don't let them make a mistake Right, let them get it all right. 80 20 rule 80% of what they can do, make build their confidence. So, show her here's what's in the tens, here's what's in the hundreds, here's what's in the thousands. Which one do you want to do? Oh, the hundredths, you mean the number five, right? The number five, okay. So, what's the answer? Five, you got it right, excellent. Make sure they get it right, build that confidence. But now it's too late, she's upset. So, okay, we give her a break. Okay, guys, what are we going to do on our break? How do we get her calm? What's our crisis tool? Type it in. Good. Type it in. How, what's our crisis tool? When kids are emotionally dysregulated, what are we going to do with her? Right? What's the over, overriding term for what we do as a crisis tool? I'm just giving you the Jed Baker map of things. So what do you think is the word that I would use to describe the crisis tool we use when people are emotionally dysregulated? I actually said it at the outset. Distraction is correct. Redirection, distraction, same thing to me. Yep. So what are the categories? Novel items, special interests, or um, a, a sensory break of some kind. And so maybe I'm going to give her a snack. Maybe we're going to watch, look at a little Disney book that we have with all the favorite princesses she has. Um, you know, and we, we look at uh, you know, the Disney character, we look at Hannah Montana and, and uh, Miley Cyrus and talk about the days before she was naked and, and on crack. And, um, and reminisce uh, about that. And she'll come back to us, folks. Don't worry about it. She's coming right back because Disney, Disney personalities have to go crazy after they leave Disney and then they come back to norm normalcy. Anyway, I like her, by the way. She's a good singer. So anyway, we get her calm. What do we do after we get, uh, after we get the young lady calm, right? We bring her back right to the same work that upset her. Don't do that. That's what I used to do. Bring kids right back to the work and they would flip out because if she sees a place value math worksheet, that is now a PTSD trigger and she's gonna freak out. 
So don't show her that. Go back and do the 80-20 rule, meaning easier stuff first. What's two plus two? What's four plus four? What's five? Wow, you're on fire. You're doing great. We build that confidence, number one. Number two, when we start to do place value, I bring out a blank piece of paper. I don't show her the one that scared her before. And I put a dot on it. That's a decimal place. And I say, here's the tens, here's the hundreds, here's the thousands. And I use visual supports this time to make it concrete. Which one do you want to do? Oh, the hundreds, you mean the number five there? What, what is it again? Number five, you got it right. And we ease into it, right? Here's one of the best and easiest things you can do when kids are oppositional and defiant and don't want to do their work. It's, it's the last thing I wrote on change the trigger reduce the length of it. Our kids aren't silly and uh, they're, they're bright. They know if they see a lot of work to do, they're never going to sit down for it, especially a kid with attention issues. If they see nine place values problems on a page, there's no way you're getting them to sit down. And if they're sitting down for 45 minutes of remote learning on their least favorite subject, good luck getting them to sit down. But if you say, I just want you to sit for five minutes, we're just going to do the first activity and that's it. And then we can take a break. And then some of those kids, once you get started, you can get through the whole 45 minutes, but just shrink the intimidation factor, reduce the amount of time, reduce the amount of problems they've got to do to make it less scary. Okay. Um, so, and of course, make it fun, right? I mean, and that's what uh, we were talking about last week. Uh, uh, last session as well. How would we make place value fun, right? Well, I had a teacher who used a rock for a decimal point and kids got to step in the tenths and step in the hundredths and that's fun. Um, we could do, uh, if they happen to be Japanese anime, Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh fans, we could use like numbers and points from those games uh, and, and work that in a little bit, work, work their favorite thing into the math, okay? The skill though that we wanna teach this young lady is, uh, is trying when it's hard. And that's what we talked about last week. To try it, ask for help if you need it, ask to watch first. 50% of the kids who are really oppositional and defiant and refuse to do work, when I just say these magic words to them, I say these magic words, it works half the time. Don't do it. Don't do the work, just watch, but don't do it, just watch. And then after they watch, I might be able to say, well, don't do all of it, but if you wanna do the first part, you can. Gradual exposure for fear, gradual exposure, little baby steps, okay? Take a break. Verbal and nonverbal kids can give you, unless verbal kids can give you a break card. Three minutes on a timer and people say, well, they'll never come back from a break. They won't come back from a break if you make them work for 40 minutes at a time. But if they know they only have to work for like a five minute center and then they can take a break and then another five minutes and then they can take a break and another five minutes, they will come back from a break. Then they learn that breaks, that the work isn't forever. And verbal kids can learn to negotiate. I would much rather have a kid negotiate with his teacher than refuse to do work altogether. Some kids I don't negotiate with. They're born attorneys, congenital attorneys. They come out of the womb negotiating. There and and you know they have mad skills. They have great skills. I'm talking about the kids who don't have those legal skills, and they and they just refuse to do work altogether. Those would be kids for whom it would be great if they could just say, "Well, I'll just do this part if you help me with that part." Okay. I'm, Jenna, you like congenital attorneys. I'm glad you like that, Jenna. Uh, maybe <laughs> maybe you grew up with them. All right, you can use that. Um, so. What does it mean to try when it's hard? Uh, it means to have Carol Dweck's growth mindset. We talked about it last time. I'm not going to uh, reiterate that uh, screen. It's up there on the slide from last time, which all of you should be able to get from Mark. But I will just give you the concept. Carol Dweck's growth mindset is simply this. You're not stupid if you don't understand something. That's part of learning. That's fixed mindset thinking, as if you're born with intelligence that never changes. That's not the case. We're born to grow. We get smarter as we learn stuff. And that means you're going to do stuff you don't know how to do. You're going to make a mistake with it. And the way that you get better with stuff is that you try it, you screw it up, and you ask somebody for help. 
The key to getting better in life is you, you don't give up and you ask for help. Those two things. It isn't just, by the way, um, trying. We tell kids to try all the time. And that's a mistake. It's not just trying. You have to be able to ask for help. We have to take them off the hook that they're not stupid if they need help. When I was a kid, I used to watch Bugs Bunny cartoons. And there was the famous tortoise and the hare. I don't know if you remember. The, what's the moral, guys, of the tortoise and the hare story, right? Type it in. Anybody? Type it in. What's the moral of the story of the tortoise and the hare? Remember? Yeah, slow and steady wins the race. That's right. Well, guess what, guys? That's only half of the equation for Carol Dweck. Slow and steady, never giving up. That doesn't actually work if it's all by itself. In the, in the old uh, Bugs Bunny video, Cecil Turtle beat Bugs Bunny in the race. And how did Cecil Turtle beat Bugs Bunny? By the way, Cecil Turtle is actually Mitch McConnell. They talk and they look exactly the same. Have you noticed that? Cecil Turtle, right? Um, am I allowed to say that, Mark? Is, it's I being, guess so. All right, I guess so. It's done. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. All of a sudden, Mitch is becoming like a decent guy. Ha ha, right? Boom. All right, anyway. So let's go on. I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, but um, here's the deal, guys. How did Cecil Turtle win the race against Bugs Bunny? He had a jetpack. He went to Acme, like all Warner Brother cartoon characters. He went to Acme, got a jetpack. Boom. That's help. That's tutoring. That's one on one help. Okay. Um, and there was another one where he had all his cousins line up at the, on the race uh, and, and they looked like him and Bugs Bunny couldn't believe it. So he got help from his cousins. Point being, you've got to teach our kids that it's not only okay to ask for help, but that's how you get smarter. And, and often we say, oh, I don't want our kid. I want our kid to learn how to be independent. Guess what independence is? I'm an independent adult, but I still ask plenty of people for help. What's different is when I was a child, there was only one person I asked for help. My mom, maybe my dad occasionally if he was home. <laughs> Remember, dads weren't home. I'm home all the time. I'm helping my kids, but back then dads were never home. All right, so the issue is now that I'm an adult, I asked a ton of people for help. That's independence. Independence means you're not just dependent on one person for help. Your eggs are in lots of baskets. I, could, I go to my guy to help the mechanic for my car. I go to my accountant for my taxes because they're way too complicated. You know, I go to my medical doctor for all my medical ailments. I have a lot of slides on that later. I'll show you my, all my MRIs. No, just kidding. All right. Uh, we talked about having a poster, right? For trying when it's hard. So anytime kids try or ask for help or take a break and come back again, they get a point on the trying when it's hard poster. We, we reward effort, not outcome. We reward effort, not outcome, okay? Uh, and, um, and that's what we need to do for all special needs kids because uh, we don't care if they get the work done right. We just know if they're willing to try and ask for help, that's what they, that they're in the learning process. There's the Carol Dweck stuff. Um, we, so here's what I want to show you. And you're, you're welcome to use these. If you go to YouTube and when you're at YouTube, you click my name, Jed Baker, no more meltdowns. You're going to come across um, a bunch of videos, video modeling lessons that we made. And here's one that was on trying when it's hard, dealing with difficult work. And you're welcome to show these to your kids. They're free. Now, if you wanna purchase video modeling lessons of all of my skills for my social skill book, you can purchase that, except you will notice that the entire thing is in Norwegian, is in Norse. No, it's true. There's a, a Norwegian company that, um, created video modeling lessons of every single lesson I had on my social skill training book. They're called Vimo, V-I-M-O, Vimo. And you're welcome to go at it. Um, it's just, it's all in Norwegian, but this one is in English and you can get these for free on YouTube. Take a look. One of the most common triggers is a demanding task. In a school setting, a writing task can be a very challenging situation. 
In the next scene, you're gonna see a student, Don, who's saddled with a writing task. You're gonna see what happens when teachers respond with a one-size-fits-all discipline approach. Hey, John, I need you to fill out this application, some personal information, and uh, four pages more, I believe. I am not doing this. Don, that's not how we speak in a class. I gotta put your name on the board, you know that. It's a warning. That's a warning, kiddo. Can we get to it now? I said I'm not doing it. All right, I gotta put a check mark next to your name. Now you know, Don, I gotta call your parents now. You gonna do it? Still too hard. That's a detention. You know not to do that. Now you go to detention. I don't care. What you just saw is a student and a teacher who weren't sure how to handle a demanding situation. Our student, Don, needs to know how to cope more effectively with a difficult writing task. He needs to learn how to try when it's hard, how to ask for help. So our next step is to teach him those skills. Don, I want to teach you about trying when it's hard. So when we give you work in school, are you supposed to know how to do all of it already? No. No, 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 exactly. You're not supposed to know everything already, otherwise you wouldn't need to be in school. So when we give you work to do, you can try it, but if you don't know how to do it, you can ask to watch first. Okay? You can ask for help, because that's how you learn, by getting help. You can make a deal. You can say, if I do this part, Dr. Baker, will you help me with that part? Yes. Or you could ask for a break if you need it. So instead of getting mad or throwing stuff, you can do any of these things. Ask for help, ask for a break, any of this to try when it's hard. Just because we teach Don how to try when it's hard doesn't mean he's going to remember to do it. That is, to generalize it to a real deal situation. We're going to have to remind him just before we give him a difficult task, like writing. That's what you'll see in the next scene. Don, I have an application for employment for you to fill out. Um, are you supposed to know how to do this already? No. No, this is new work. You're not supposed to know how to do it yet, right? Right. So if you get frustrated or annoyed, you could, you could try it, but you could ask to watch first if you need it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Instead of yelling or screaming, you could say, help me. You could ask for help. Mm -hmm. You could um, make a deal with me if you want. You could say, uh, you know, I'll do this part if Dr. Baker, you help me with that part. If you want a break, you can take a break too. A minute, two, and then you can come back and try it again. Shall we try it? Yeah. Okay, let's give it a shot. Let me try it. Actually, can I just watch first? Sure, let me, let me show you how we do this, right? So Don, this is where you put your last name, so I'll write my last name here. And that's where you would put your last name. Up here, I'll put my first name, right? So this is where you'll put your first name. In the next scene, you'll see Don continue to use the skill trying when it's hard, this time by asking for help. Can you help me? Uh, sure. Now, do you need help with the answers or do you need help just writing them? Just writing them. Okay. All right. Tell you what. I'll write them and you just tell me what the answers are. Okay? Okay. So they're asking for uh, city and state. So what city? Um, what city are we in? Livingston. Okay, so I'll write that for you. In the next scene, Don continues to try when it's hard, this time by asking for a break. Dr. Baker, can I please take a break? Sure, sure. What, you want to go read? Sure. Okay, I'm going to time it for two minutes, okay? Okay. All right, here we go. All right, break over. Let's get back, we'll do a little bit more, okay? All right. All right, good job. So after Don uses the skill trying when it's hard, we want to review it with him to reinforce that skill. So Don, did you try when work was hard instead of getting angry? Yes. Indeed you did. Did you ask for help or ask to watch first if you needed it? Yeah. And did you take a break if you needed it? Yeah. So instead of getting in trouble, you managed a new work. You learned something new, right? Right. Give me a high five, man. You're the man. All right. Great job. I learned about it's okay to ask for help. No one's perfect. And 
When I ask for help, I don't get in trouble or angry. So what did we learn? Instead of escalating the problem, we taught the student a better way to cope with the situation. We primed him on that skill before the task, coached him in the moment, and reviewed with him afterwards to reinforce that skill. So listen, you can use that lesson um, with your kids, but more importantly, I wanna just point out one of the keys to sort of social skills training and generalization. No matter what we tell our kids, no matter what lessons we have, they're not gonna generalize the skill and use it unless you get it into their Dr. Banner forebrain before they get hijacked by the Incredible Hulk. So any therapy session I have with Don, say, and I do that lesson, it's not gonna work unless I've equipped his teacher. In that case, it was me, but if it wasn't, I'd have to tell the teacher, before you do difficult work, remind him, he can ask for help, he can ask to watch first. You've gotta get the skill into the logical, legal, scientific Dr. Banner brain before they're hijacked by the prehistoric uh, Incredible Hulk, okay? That's the key to generalization. Get it in there before it happens. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about dealing with fear. We, we talked um, a fair amount about it last, uh, last time, so I'm going to do it uh, briefly here. Uh, sometimes we got to, you know, change. You don't have to uh, face every fear. We, we, we can modify some of them, um, but some we, we need to teach. And basically what we're doing with almost all anxiety is when somebody has unrealistic fears, where the situation really isn't dangerous, we're trying all different kinds of ways to get them to gradually face their fear. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy, think like a scientist, is persuasion. We talk to them to try to face their fears. Obviously, that's for more verbal kids. Um, but for less verbal kids, we kind of reward them for being in situations. Like I had a kid who was just afraid to go to a, to a lunchroom. It was a change, it was a different kind of thing. And so we had him pass by the lunchroom for a second and he got a point for that. Then we had him pass and stop at the door and look inside. He got a, a two points for that. And these points added up to um, snack rewards and other things that he wanted to. And then we had him go inside for three minutes then for four minutes and so on. Gradual exposure, gradual exposure, okay? So um, I, I said you could avoid some situations. So when we modify triggers, uh, fire alarm is a good example. I never, uh, I haven't had a lot of luck desensitizing kids to fire alarms. You could play fire alarms all you want and some kids will just always be freaked out by it. It's just the way their physiology is. And so those are kids that I just get you out before the fire alarm goes. And so uh, that's okay. You can avoid that one but you can't avoid doing all work, right? The other thing I like to look for when I have a, an increase in anxiety is like, why now? What's the larger context of stressors? And so I had a kid with OCD, a lot of hand washing, and we've gotten it kind of under control, but he goes off to high school and it goes through the roof, the hand washing. And it turns out he had a much higher work demand um, with less support for get, helping him get his work done and he had a larger social demand. Uh, he had had a middle school group that he didn't have now and he had no peers, so he was off alone. By giving him a, a robotics club at high school to, to help him connect with other kids, by giving him a homework assistance uh, class in, during the school day so he'd get a lot of his work done before he went home, hand washing started to go down. He still had the issue, we still had to work on hand washing, but we went back to baseline levels. So you gotta look for the larger context of stressors. And the last thing is trauma, traumatic living conditions. That's one of those things where it's a real danger. So we're not asking you to face your fears. When people are living in traumatic living conditions, you know, we do safety first. We try to get you out of that, or we try to give you respite for that. When I worked in an inner city setting, with primarily, these were the kids who had trouble and they were often kids who um, had substance abuse and uh, incarceration and other kinds of abuse in their backgrounds. And so we often had wraparound services, after school services, coaching teams, clubs, to just keep them with positive adult role models as long as we could during the day. Um, now, when the trauma is over, then kids have to process it, you know, to, to sort of manage PTSD, the goal is to help kids learn the difference between now and then. 
then was really dangerous, but now is safe. And so we don't want them to avoid the memories. We want them to begin to have the memory and then connect it with, but I'm safe now. Let's look around me like nobody's hurting me now, but it did happen then. Or I'm bigger and older now and I can stop it where I couldn't stop it then. Okay. That's a, that's a key to getting over trauma. It's processing the memories and connecting it with the new information that now you're safe. So those memories don't have a hold on you anymore. When we work with kids on their fears, we try to uh, educate verbal kids. Um, well, first of all, I try to win them over first to why is it worth working on this, right? So uh, my OCD kid, um, he didn't feel like he needed help with, uh, with his washing behavior. Um, it got to a point where he was washing so much he didn't get into high school at all. He didn't make it in. And his parents were worried about that, but he wasn't. But by going over his talents and his strengths and all that he could do in his life and booing him up to show him how talented he was, then I was able to say, so let's just see if we can get the washing behavior down to a level where you can still reach your goals because you're so bright, you're going to do so many things. And so sometimes that's the way I start with almost every client I have who's verbal from four years old to 104 years old. We talk about your talents and places those talents will take you. And we talk about, let's just work on the challenges so they don't get in your way. That's how I partner with a client to work on these shared goals. And then we explain anxiety. That you have an alarm system, the Incredible Hulk system, it's in there, and it's like fake news. Listen, you fake news, you fake news. Fake news, fake, fake news, fake news. Um, were you able to hear that, by the way? Yeah, we heard it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so... <laughs> That fake news is the propaganda worry channel in your brain. It's the anxiety channel. It spews out propaganda. It's kind of like Fox News. And, no, I'm kidding. Can I say that? I don't know. I thought you just did. I did. I know I'm going to keep doing that until nobody hires me anymore. All right. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's propaganda. And then cognitive behavior therapy is fact checking. Cognitive behavior therapy is the thing that says, hey, is this really accurate? Do I, I know it's on, like the propaganda channel, that's your anxiety channel in your brain, you can't turn it off. It's just there, it's in the background. You can't turn it off, but you don't have to do what it tells you to do. You don't have, I can't get rid of certain news networks. It comes with my cable package, but I don't have to listen to them, but it's there, it's there. Um, and so the goal of, anxiety treatment is not to get rid of your worries you can't really it's to not be held hostage by your worries okay to know it's there in the background and and so part of that is despite having this worry i got to gradually face the fear to realize it's not going to get to me and we call that creating fear ladders right so you're not going to face your worst fear yet it's difficult so we create a ladder here was a girl with selective mutism, quite capable in terms of her ability to talk and converse, but she only did it at home. She never did it in school. And so we set up a point system with rewards where all she had to do was nod yes or no. She got a point and then whisper to a friend who she liked, who, she, who would then talk to the teacher for her and so on. And for each step of the ladder, she got points. And those points were exchanged for snacks and special rewards at school, and then some special privileges at home. Okay. Uh, and so we stayed in this sort of positive approach with her. We never forced her to talk because if you force people who are anxious to do things, it only makes them more anxious. Um, so that's a fear ladder. Okay. And we use rewards for some kids. Some kids don't need rewards. They just are glad to eventually overcome their fear, but other kids are gonna need these rewards. And then um, the other part of getting people to face their fear is uh, to persuade them. If they're verbal kids, we're gonna use persuasion. And persuasion is basically helping them think like a scientist. Okay, somebody sighed very heavily. Now, I'm sorry, I know I'm talking, about it, but I got a lot of energy because uh, I finally slept. I was doing a talk to Norway in the middle of last night, like all night long, because apparently 3 a.m. here 
is like 9 a.m. there. So anyway, OCD. Uh, here's my kid with OCD. How do I help him to deal with anxiety? We ask two questions to think like a scientist. Number one, whatever worry you have, are you overestimating the probability of something bad happening? That's the first question. Number two, am I overestimating how bad it would be if it did happen? So here was this kid with OCD and here was his fears. We created this think like a scientist cue card for him. He was afraid to uh, touch things. This is, pre, this is pre COVID. Okay. This is before COVID. This would look a lot different now, but he was afraid to touch things because he would get a lethal disease. Um, and we would go over the realistic outcome, but that you have skin, it protects you from germs getting into your body and, and hurting you. And actually we have pretty good, pretty good data now that although I still wash my hands a lot, even COVID does not seem to be uh, spread as much as we thought through surfaces anyway, it's really through the air. Um, the next issue is not being able to wash repeatedly. He was really fearful that if he couldn't wash off germs, they would eventually get into his body and kill him. And uh, at that time we talked about, um, you know, if you washed once with warm water, you get rid of the germs, but if you wash uh, repeatedly with burning hot water, you could cause cracks in your skin and that could let a germ in. Um, and also the germs back then, we didn't have COVID back then and it was just gonna be a cold or something like that, it wouldn't kill him. So we use this think like a scientist uh, cue card every time we met him to convince him then to face his fears. And again, this is pre-COVID. I wouldn't do it like this now during this pandemic, but um, we had him touching things in public and going longer and longer amounts of time before, um, before um, washing his hands, giving him rewards for being able to do that. Till one day he went a whole day without washing his hands, didn't get sick, and it was a very important lesson that allowed him to go about life, right? Um, I think last session I showed you, I think like a scientist cue card for a kid who had fears of COVID, it looked a lot different. We weren't having him touch things in public. We were just having him go outside with a mask six feet apart. That that's, was our goal with him. Um, the other thing we talk about with fear and anxiety is the things you can do to calm those fears like exercise, meditation, uh, I didn't mention this last time, but neurofeedback may help with anxiety management. Uh, there's some research on that. And medications, as long as they don't have too bad of a side effect, right? Um, you always have to risk uh, 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 benefit uh, to, to the risks of, of those medications. But look, every kid who has anxiety issues should be exercising and they should be doing some kind of meditation. Those are two 100% free activities that cost nothing. You don't have to get a gym membership to take a walk, okay? Um, all right, let's go to the next trigger, having to wait. Nope, you can't have a piece of cake now, but if you're calm, mommy has some beautiful consolation prizes behind curtain number two. This is uh, from my book, No More Meltdowns, and this is the category of having kids learn that all is not lost if they don't get what they want. How do you help kids wait? Well, one way to do it, uh, is to use a visual timer. I once had this kid who was just yelling and screaming and tam tantruming in his classroom because there was gonna be this Valentine's Day party and the teacher had put out cookies, but the party wasn't gonna be for 40 minutes, but she had already put out the cookies and he just kept grabbing the cookies and he had to be um, literally physically removed from the class. He was screaming, yelling, tearing things apart. And so he needed to learn how to wait, but he was less verbal. And so just telling him, oh, we're going to have the cookies in 40 minutes, like that didn't work with him. How do you teach him to wait? I took him into my support room where I had cookies. I said, you want a cookie? Cookie. And I used a visual timer. He don't, you can't tell time on a clock, but I used a visual timer for which you don't have to buy them anymore. There are apps for this. They're called the time timer apps. And, and you see a shape and it's shrinking. And I say, you want a cookie? And I put it on for 10 seconds and he sees a shape shrink. Beep, now you can have the cookie. Hey, you want two cookies? And I made him wait a whole minute. And so he sees the shape shrinking, shrinking. He sees the progress, it's getting closer. Beep, now you can have two cookies and so on. Three minutes, I make him wait for three cookies until he realizes, you know, uh, waiting doesn't mean you'll never get what you want. Waiting means there's a timer and when the timer's up, you get what you want. And the longer you wait, the bigger the reward. What a useful skill 
for this less verbal kid. Everywhere he went, where he wanted something and he began to tantrum, it was, you know, before he really tantrum, it was like, wait, here's a timer. And now he got, he knew the plan. He knew how it worked. Visual support. I get, I'll get it. I just have to wait. But what do you do when you can't have something at all? That's called accepting no for an answer. You have to learn to accept a substitute, right? Um, so I'm going to show you that in a second, but I want to, I want to share a couple other things with you. Many of our kids have perseverative interests. They just want to watch SpongeBob 24 hours, seven days a week, uh, or whatever it is. We don't take that away from them, but you got to put it on a schedule. Video games got to be on a schedule. So it's easier to stop a video game if you know when you can go back to it, right? Um, and so whatever their perseverations are, they can do it, but it's got to be on a schedule. There are some perseverations that are really disruptive for others. For example, I had a kid who constantly would turn the lights on and off in his classroom. Anybody have some of those? Or a kid who was constantly running to see the toilet flush so he could see the toilet go down, right? What did we do? We videotaped it, put it on an iPad. Anytime he wanted to see the toilet flush or turn the lights on and off, he could do it on his iPad and just see it virtually. That stopped him from disrupting it for everybody else, okay? So um, give that a shot with, your, uh, with, with, your, with the person who just said this, they've got that person at home turning lights on and off. Who is that? It, yeah, Aiden, give it a shot. Um, all right, so a to-do box is another good thing. You're on a work call. You're trying to get your kid to do remote learning and you've got like the most important conference call of your life. You're about to get hired for a life-changing job and your kid is knocking on the door every five seconds to ask when their chicken nuggets might be ready. And so, uh, well, what are we gonna do? Um, a to-do box. First of all, we're gonna tell them when they're ready for us, put a timer out, but we give them stuff to do while they're waiting. A to-do box is just things that they can do, you know, twirl your scars, play your xylophone, do this puzzle. And by the time you're done, I'll be off the call and I'll get the job and it'll change our life. Um, let's talk about accepting no. I'm gonna show you a video of big 14 to 20 year olds who when they didn't get what they wanted, they hit staff members. And so because of that, they got kicked out of a lot of schools and they came to me and the Rutgers program developmental disability program asked me, could you teach these guys how to wait or how to accept no? It's an important skill that they need to learn. So I start out by telling them how smart they are, their strengths, their talents to win them over. AS, Asperger's syndrome stands for advanced species. You're gonna see me talking like that. And then we talk about, uh, I, I explain model and I role play accepting no, that if you don't get this, there's still something else to live for, right? So take a look. Nice. You know what all these people have in common? What are what are some of their talents? Anybody? What, Asperger's. Asperger's. They have Asperger's. What does that mean? What are some of the Advanced strengths species. of people? That's exactly what I think, right? Say it again. Advanced species. AS stands for advanced species. Okay? A lot of people with Asperger's <laughs> syndrome are brilliant, talented people, right? Oh, I have kids with Asperger's, students with Asperger's, who, you know, all of them experience stress on a daily basis. Um, in terms of handling the academic and social demands. Some people handle that by withdrawing and becoming depressed. And they don't really bother anybody else. But they're having their own internal struggle. Others handle it by externalizing and acting out and becoming sometimes verbally or sometimes physically aggressive. I'm going to get ready to interrupt you, to stop you right in the middle. You going to deal with it? Yes. Give me a high five. I'm so pleased. That you did that. Can I? Can you put it down? Because watch what I'll do. Watch what I'll do. Go ahead now. He, did he stop in the middle? Mm -hmm. Great job. Give me a high five. Great job. A lot of social skills just come naturally. You sort of know what to do because you're you're reading other people's minds. You know, not like a psychic, but just getting an idea of you know uh, if I. If I can accept no for an answer, you know, the person will be cool with me and then I may get what I want. That just comes naturally, you're reading that perspective. That's not coming naturally for these guys. All right, check this out. Wait a second, I want, I want to teach you something first. Hold on, Stefan. Sometimes when you ask for something like pretzels, people might name. say no. Look at number 56. Right? Sometimes people say no when you ask okay, for something. Okay, used to it. Well, if you do get used to it, if you're cool about it, if you don't get mad, others will be pleased with you and they might give you what you want later, or 
If they can't give you that, they might give you something else you want, right? You can make explicit what's not coming naturally. That's the purpose of these skill lessons. Pam, can I have some of that uh, chocolate? I'm sorry, Janet. That belongs to somebody else. You fascist! You're a fascist! I hate you! I can't stand you! But what you saw was just skill acquisition, just the knowledge of skills. And so what we did today won't go very far unless we also make efforts to generalize those skills, meaning to um, remind them of this issue seconds before they might need it. Did I accept no about the chocolate? Did I accept that? No. She was not pleased? She wasn't pleased. That's right. David, how was she feeling when I yelled? I Uncomfortable. Her Uncomfortable. Did it make her want to give me the pretzels? No. No. You know, we're always keeping them on, sort of aware of the light at the end of the tunnel. And so we don't always have to create the artificial rewards for that. They already exist. For the most part, all of us have something invested in maintaining control. There's always something good that happens if we maintain that self-control. Oh, you want to see that? Yeah. Um, no, not right now. Oh, give me a high five. No. <laughs> Okay. All right, guys. Uh, and quick thing, Mark, if you're there, for, uh, it looks like there's some people in the waiting room. Uh, yeah, I see them. Okay, great. Okay, so um, we teach them accepting no for an answer. If you don't get this, there are other things you can get. Um, what do we do for less verbal kids? Well, we do it visually. You have a schedule. Their normal schedule, it's a picture schedule, but whatever they're not going to get today because it's raining out and you're not going to go outside for fun time, you know, you exit out. And you put a substitute, a substitute that they really like, their favorite indoor game, their favorite thing to do indoors. And so hopefully that offsets the loss, okay? But um, what do we do? We teach them this on uh, Monday, except you know for an answer. Tuesday, they put money in the snack machine and no snack comes out. Do they have an aha moment where they say, oh, this is like accepting no for an answer. Uh, page 38 of Jed Baker's manual. Uh, and do they accept it or do they just freak out and try to break the machine? Well, likely is that they're going to break the machine because skills don't generalize. How do we compensate for that? Prime the Dr. Banner forebrain every morning. Every morning with those kids in that program, we would go over potential disappointments during the day. We knew if it rained out, they were going to be disappointed and couldn't go outside. So we told them it might rain, but if it does, look what I got. I got your musical equipment, the film equipment, another reason to live, right? Um, so sometimes you've got to get that into the Dr. Banner uh, forebrain ahead of time every day. I also use a disappointment poster. We did that with the kids in this program. We said, if you don't get something you want, but you're cool about it, you get a point on the disappointment poster. And when we get 20 points, we go to the school store and you can get something you want. And so this was a, a concrete way of making sure there's always a silver lining. If you don't get this, but you're calm about it, you're gonna get something else, okay? You're still earning towards a reward. Let's talk about uh, self-esteem handling mistakes, okay? Carol Dweck, Growth Mindset, she said, you got to make mistakes. That's how you learn. That's how you learn. And so we want to send off kids to make mistakes because then we know they're learning. If they get it right, I don't know if you're learning. I want you to get it wrong. I know then that you're going to learn something new. Let me prove it to you. All of you out there in the audience, I want you to do this with me now at home. You ready? We're going to say the word silk, S-I-L-K. I want you to say the word silk with me five times fast. Is everybody ready? Here we go. I'm going to count it off. Silk. 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 Okay, tell me, what do cows drink? Silk. What do cows drink? Put it in your chat. Milk. milk. All right, here's somebody saying milk, right? But milk. I got to tell you, cows do not drink milk. Milk. Cows actually drink water, and calves drink milk. And so that's a mistake. And that's okay that we made a mistake. It's a, it's a, it's a trick. I'm just tricking you. Okay. But we learn from our mistakes. Let me prove it to you. Cows drink water, calves drink milk, but cows drink water. Let me prove it to you. Say silk three times fast with me. Here we go. Silk, silk, silk. What do cows drink? My color. What do cows drink? Somebody's phone is on guys. So you got to mute yourselves. All right, uh, we drink water. There you go. And how'd you know that? You know it because 
you learn, you learn from mistakes. So what are we going to do? We're going to take every one of our kids who's a perfectionist and we're going to create a reward chart where if they make a mistake, which means they're trying work they haven't seen before, if they make a mistake and then they ask for help to get help to correct it, they're going to get three points. But if they get the work right the first time, they get less points, only two points because they probably weren't challenging themselves. So we're actually going to give more points for handling a mistake. And we're going to do the same with our kids who have trouble with losing a game. If you lose a game or you're not first in something, I had a kid who always had to be first. If you're not first, if you're second or third and you don't get mad, you get three points for that. Now, if you win a game, well, that's easy. You get two points for that. Anybody can do that. But if you lose a game without getting mad, you win the invisible game of friendship. People like you. If you're cool about it, you're a good sport and you get three points, right? What about teasing? What are we going to do about that? Uh, well, we got to teach them how to handle teasing, uh, that it's, it's not your fault. If somebody teases you, they're the one who has a problem. They're probably mad about something. It's not, if they call you a jerk, it's not because you're a jerk, right? Check it out first. Tell them, are you serious? Because some kids are just playing around. They just want to play. And so they say, you're stupid, and they just want you to chase them. So check it out first. See, what, see on the bottom of the screen? Uh, tell them to stop if you don't like it. Hey, cool it and ignore it. And then walk, uh, walk away. And if it continues, report it. Why do we report it? Because that's being brave and you're stopping somebody from teasing somebody else. That person who's teasing you probably teases other people. And so if it continues, we report it. But I don't report it right off the bat. I try to get them to stop. If they won't, then we can report it. But more importantly, how do you deal with teasing? You protect people from teasing. How do we protect people from teasing? We get other kids involved. Peer buddy programs. Take a look at what we did in middle, Mil, uh, Milburn Middle School many years ago. A lot of schools have these peer buddy programs where they get peers to protect other kids. Hold on, trying to get it. Last night we met some young people who have a form of autism called Asperger's syndrome. Gentle, vulnerable children who had become the targets of constant taunts from classroom bullies because they are different. Tonight ABC's John Donvan looks at how one school has found a creative way to help protect these children and teach everyone something in the process. Middle school, where the worst thing when you're one of the different kids, as Noah Orant is, the worst thing is the other kids. In my old school, I never had many friends. I was just merely called Game Boy Freak or stuff. Game Boy Freak? Yeah. yeah. That was before. This is now. On a scale from 1 to 10, how happy would you be here? Let's do our conversation game. Here's what we're going to do, guys. This year, Noah attends Milburn, New Jersey Middle School, where psychologist Jed Baker is proving that the best protection for kids like Noah, who was bullied for years for his disability, Asperger's syndrome, a form of high-functioning autism, the best protection is the other kids. What's your favorite game to play? Can't tell. Can't, can't tell? It's a secret. It's a, it's a secret. I'm just kidding. I think it's cool like that even though they're not like me, I can still be, have things in common with them. <laughs> Baker has recruited Becca and other kids as essentially his assistants in teaching Noah and Eli social skills that Asperger's make so challenging for them like simple conversation. It's benefiting all students to really respond to the needs to teach kids to do the social emotional skills. The thing is, they're getting it. So it's easier here. Yeah, Why? now I have like a big crew. You have a huge crew now? Yeah, a lot of friends. Good, good. In fact, kids strive to get into the program here at Milburn. More than 90% of the eighth grade class is signed up and bullying of kids with Asperger's, it's non-existent here. Working with what were once called the uncool kids yeah. has become a cool thing to do. Yeah, I think it's part of the identity and value of a lot of the peers in that environment to be sort of a good person. Uh, to Imagine be, that. Yeah. You want to find out what game she likes? What game she likes? I like. Some kids especially need a lot of people just ignore them. It makes me feel really good that I made some, like, somebody else like smile or just make their day. It's like I'm in heaven here. Really? But back there, it's like hell. <laughs> so this is heaven. Yes. What Noah and other kids like him are learning here, they're going to need it because in the world outside, Asperger's will always make them different. And most people don't get the lessons they teach so well here at Milburn Middle School.
John Donvan, ABC News, Milburn, New Jersey. If you're with me in my third session next week, I'm going to talk about peer buddy programs for kids with much less language, how we modify games and activities and bring typically developing peers into play with our kids who have uh, autism and uh, more severe language issues. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do is bring, you know, create these environments. It's one of the key components of social skills training. We're not just trying to get our kids to fit in. We're getting other people to reach out and include. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about unmet needs for attention. I mentioned to you, if you're a parent, you're on the phone, you know, put a red green sign on your door. So they know red light, stop green go schedule when they can see you use a visual timer so they know when they can have your attention but there's some of our kids who um have a very difficult time getting attention in positive ways they 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 tend to say really provocative things they curse they yell they scream um, these are kids who need to sort of learn ways that get attention in positive ways and i usually will make a card that looks something like this it might say public private, it might say okay or not okay, it might say expected behavior, unexpected behavior. But basically there are two columns with what you can say around other people and what you shouldn't be saying around other people. Um, I've violated many of these today already as Mark can attest to, but um, what we said for this kid uh, is look, he was saying really provocative things about sex, violence, race, religion, and politics. And it was upsetting to people. Um, and so, and I know I, I've already, uh, you know, uh, done that uh, in terms of politics today a little bit, but, um, the issue, and so I need this card, but, uh, on the left side, what we said for him is he could do some good conversation skills past. How was your week future? What are you going to do after school? What are you going to do this weekend? Present. Um, you know, what are you guys doing? Uh, these are all conversation starters. So the first word is just a reminder of the category of conversation starter. So in the present tense, what are you guys doing? What are you guys reading? What are you guys playing? What are you guys eating? Or the last one is common or others interests, right? Uh, if I know something about you, those are the best conversation starters. A Harvard study recently showed that people like you more when you say things, not just like, hey, how are you? How was your week? That's fine. But it's really if they ask you about stuff that they already know about you. Like, I'd like to know if Mark Corrala's daughter is gonna be on the, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but she's an incredible singer and incredible career ahead of her. And so I gotta ask them about that. Um, and so uh, asking about other people's interests is a way uh, to, to be sort of appropriate in public. Now, what's not okay is then, you know, talking about sex, violence, race, religion, and politics, avoiding insults, curses. These are things you can say quietly to your parents or whisper or talk to your therapist, but not necessarily in public. Uh, all that's good. We teach them the skill, but they're not going to necessarily do it unless we train the kids around those, that kid to ignore them when they say the inappropriate stuff, but engage with them when they say the appropriate stuff. You've got to teach the other kids to do that, right? Sometimes we have a response cost system where we say, we're going to give you a snack and let you watch your favorite show, something like this, like the Simpsons here, right? Um, for this kid. But if he says something inappropriate, he gets a warning. If he says it again, you know, he gets another warning. The third time he loses a snack. Fourth time he loses increments of the Simpsons, right? Um, so uh, this is what we did for, for that kid. Um, Okay, I'm gonna continue and then I wanna take your questions. Uh, second to last issue, sensory issues. Some kids are gonna need a quiet environment. They're gonna need a safe place to go when it gets overwhelming and, and, and uh, difficult. Some kids need just the opposite. They need more sensory uh, uh, stimulation. Kids with ADHD, they get bored and they need to get up and move around and do some more fun things. Whatever it is they need, we want them to develop some uh, good advocacy skills where they can ask for what they need. It's too loud for me. Can I have a quiet spot? Or if it's a less verbal kid, can they, they have a little card that says quiet area, please? Okay. Um, a lot of our kids do some self-stimming behavior, such as scripting. They script off of a show and they just say the same thing over and over again. 
when you see a lot of that behavior, it means whatever we're doing with them may not be engaging them in that moment. So when I have less verbal kids with autism and I see them just scripting something over and over, repeating the same thing, it may indicate that whatever activity I'm doing, they're not understanding. So I may go to an activity I know they can do. Touch your nose, touch your head, touch your shoulder. And then I re-engage that kid and now we're locked in and they're attending to me as opposed to retreating in a self-stem world where they're flapping their hands or looking at something else. That may mean that whatever I'm doing is not fully engaging them. There's a special self-stim behavior that I was, um, I think that I was going to talk to you about. Mark, I don't know if I mentioned this to you. So I want to give you guys uh, a heads up. Okay. Yeah. So look, uh, some of our kids masturbate in public. They don't know the rules about that and it gets them in trouble. And I was going to talk about it. And so I'm giving you a heads up because in case you find that to be a sensitive topic and don't want to hear about it, um, you know, take a, take a five minute break for a second. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it because it's easy to teach verbal kids the rules, which is, you know, it's okay to um, masturbate, touch yourself, but it has to be done in private. You, can, you don't do that in public. It can't be done in the living room when your kid, parents are around, like that's for your room or for the bathroom, but it's harder to teach kids who are less verbal. So we usually use some kind of a visual aid where we show like, you know, your private time is in your room. Um, it's better to have a photograph of their bathroom or their bed, bedroom rather than just any old photograph like this, because then you can go to sleepies at the mall and they think that's the time they can touch themselves. Um, so these were uh, board maker items. And so this is like, go, you can touch. This was an erect penis here. Now they, they now have them for women too. Board maker didn't have it at first, but now they do. Um, so we're showing here that, you know, your private time where you're allowed to touch yourself is in, uh, you know, is in your room or is in your bathroom. And uh, these are places on the right side, public, where you're not allowed to do that. Um, we might also... Uh, show the steps to masturbating for, I've had adult children with autism um, that we've worked with and they were not cleaning up after themselves. The parents were very upset about it. And so we did a visual schedule of how to clean up after yourself. Um, and then we can put it on a schedule as well so that there's a that private time occurs at a certain time. Why do we call it private time? We call it private time instead of masturbating because um, some kids are out in public and they yell to their parents, you know, I need private time. And I'd rather them say I need private time than I need to masturbate because that may embarrass the parents. Okay. Um, you could put it on a response cost system where they get rewards. And if they masturbate in public, then they begin to lose those rewards. I've actually never done this, um, but I don't like to use punishment or takeaways because it upsets people to do that. And I don't want to upset the Incredible Hulk. Um, but if this was purely a pleasurable activity, so they're not dysregulated with negative emotions, I would, might be willing to entertain this. But a lot of times masturbation also comes out of anxiety, in which case this would make it worse. So I'd be careful with that. Um, this is just a visual for okay touch and not okay touch. What are the okay ways to touch people at school? What are the not okay ways to touch people? Um, there are some kids I just have a no touch rule because if they touch somebody, it goes wrong. And so for those kids, we give them other things to touch. Maybe they have sensory issues and they want a doll or a doll's hair or a stuffed animal. If you can touch that, but you can't touch people who don't want to be touched. Okay. Uh, and here's the last um, slide before I take your questions. How do we prepare you for all the um, uh, unexpected triggers? We want to create a relaxation folder with kids who get upset a lot. And in the relaxation folder might be a picture of the kid getting upset, a picture of all the activities that calm them down. Maybe it's playing with Legos or doing some other things. And then a picture of them with their, the person that feel, makes them feel comfortable. Scarlett Johansson for the Incredible Hulk, your, your safety person. And we go over that every morning. You know, if you get upset, here you are upset. Here are the things you do to calm down. Here's the person you go to. And then when they're actually upset, we bring out that visual schedule, that relaxation folder, we show it to them and can they follow it step-by-step? Step? Here you are upset. Now let's go do Legos to calm down or let's go take three deep breaths to calm down. Now let's go find Miss Johnson. She'll calm you down. For verbal kids, we add something to that, which is self-talk. We teach all of our verbal kids, all problems can be solved if you can wait 
and talk to the right person. I live by that mantra. Everything can be solved for the most part. Even a global pandemic can be solved. If you can wait, it's been a year, just about, and talk to the right people, maybe Fauci, okay? Let's talk to the right people. Let's get it done. Uh, this is what gives kids hope. When they have hope that things can get better, it'll get solved. They don't have to hit the panic button. They don't have to get aggressive. We want them to have that general notion that whatever the problem is, I've lost my phone, you didn't buy me the right food, whatever it is, it can get solved. If you can wait, be patient, talk to the right person, it'll get solved, okay? Even my Xfinity Comcast cable that went out just before I was gonna do these talks this week, even that got solved. And I had to wait to talk to the right person, but I couldn't get a person on the phone from Xfinity cable for two days but I finally got somebody on the phone. I had to escalate it up to a manager who finally got somebody, even that got fixed. All right, let's take your questions, folks. What do we got? What do you got for me? A lot of questions came in, Jed. Um, some questions came in around, I'm just going through, and if anyone else has any extra ones, please feel free to come in. I know some of them, I think, you know, we're sort of looking at the range of the spectrum. So some are around um, our, our students who demonstrate, you know, pretty severe behavior around biting, hicking, kicking, screaming, hitting. And, um, you know, so there was a question around that, uh, like identifying the triggers or what, what are some potential supports for a student like that? Right. So all of that depends on what those triggers are. So what I've tried to give you guys, you see, is not what do you do for biting? What do you do for hitting? What do you do for pinching? What do you do for running away? It's not the behavior that tells us what to do. It's why the behavior occurs. And so if the behavior of biting occurs because I don't want to do a project, then you got to modify that project, right? If the biting occurs, the trigger is you didn't give me what I wanted immediately, then that kid needs to learn how to use a timer to know that they will get what they want. Now, here's a tougher one. If the biting is occurring because they have an internal pain, mm -hmm. they have a headache and they're in pain. And so they're frustrated and they bite themselves. That's a tougher one, right? We've got to solve the physical problem that's causing them pain. Pain is a reason why people are irritable and hurt. And so we've got to understand that sometimes. So, so Heather definitely is asking some really good questions. Um, uh, Heather, just a quick question. And I'm sorry, I mean to put you on the spot because we could always talk um, offline as well. So is your uh, child in a District 75 school? Because what we do at the... Um, Office of, okay, great. So what we do it, um, from the Office of Autism in addition is, is work with schools and helping with problematic behaviors. So, you know, I've been watching your comments and I think there's several um, layers that would probably need to be addressed. Uh, and we would certainly uh, look to support you in that area. So if you, um, I dropped my email in the chat and if you need it again, um, I'll just rewrite it for you so that um, we could always, uh, uh, be in touch with you to talk about specifically what some of the problematic behaviors are, if that would help. But you, to your point, Heather, too, the question about what do you do in the moment when your kid hits, again, it depends on why they're hitting, right? Often people are told, oh, I should ignore bad behavior. Not always. If my kid's finger is caught in a door and as a result, they're screaming at the top of their lungs, I don't want to ignore my kid. I want to take the door from out of their hand. Right. So if there's some reason in the moment that your kid is hitting, we got to understand that. But the goal, Heather, is to give your kid a better way to get what he needs. Right. Now, in my experience, a lot of the kids that I work with, they would hit when they didn't want to do a task. And so we taught them a way of saying, uh, I don't want to do this right now. Or, or can you help me to make it go faster? Or can I do less of it? Sometimes they hit because they couldn't have something immediately. And then we taught them how to wait using a timer. And then if they could wait, they'd get double what they wanted. So Heather, it really is going to depend on somebody going in and observing the times where they hit or you keeping track of it. So what, what the best thing you could do right now, Heather, is every time he hits, try to understand the setting, the situation just before he hit uh, and, and after, the before, during, and after, and see if you could just jot down a quick note on your phone about it 
So, uh, and, and look at the triggers that I gave you and see if you can ask that question, you know, is it, so if we go back to all of our triggers, when your kid hits, you know, is it, um, sorry, I'm going all the way back. It, uh, here, oh, there it is. Ah, well, it's going all over the place now. It has a mind of its own. Seems I went to the beginning. Uh, of all the triggers I gave you, there they are. There are the triggers. Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? You ask yourself those questions. Um, are you being asked? Are you asking him to be in a situation where he's about um, to do something that he's uh, scared to do? It's not just work that he doesn't want to do, but you're about to take him somewhere where he's scared to go. You may hit, right? So how do we handle fear? Can I just watch first? If we go, there'll be a safe place. You can wait in the car. You, could, you don't have to get out, right? There's some other way to do that. Um, so uh, Jash is asking, would you re recommend an FBA to, complete, to be completed? So the word FBA stands for functional, functional Behavioral Assessment. And that's where we're looking at the function of the behavior. We're asking the why question. Um, so I find it uh, very helpful to not just look at the function of the behavior, to escape something, to get attention, but really to focus in on the trigger. The trigger is uh, most rich with the information that you need. We do need to know how people respond to it too in the function, but we really need to know those triggers. And Jed, two, two other points that came in. Um, one, one was about speech. So in regard to speech, just something to remember that a lot of the times, if Jed had mentioned it before, that if our, you know, if our kids um, don't have a way to communicate and there are these internal triggers happening, um, that can certainly go hand in hand with behaviors. So one of the things that's really important for parents to understand is to work really closely with the speech therapist and the classroom team in trying to determine um, how to get your child to best communicate. Or, you know, most of us communicate through a variety of methods, um, but figuring out what that would be for your child is extremely important because a lot of the times we're used to either trying to eradicate a behavior or give in or ignore. And it's about trying to figure out also, well, how do we reshape that behavior and how do we use communication in such a way that could hopefully support the, the diminishment with through a team-based approach? It really takes a tremendous amount of people. And, and Mark, let me just say this too about internal pain. I had read a good article um, and, and worked with some kids in this way who had less language. And so they had some system of communication they developed, whether it was through pictures or hand signals. But one of the things they did for kids who would have internal pain and couldn't communicate it is um, over, over months of working with them, they used a doll and, um, uh, and, they, and they used the tele television shows too. And any, any, like this kid loved Arthur. And, and there was an episode of Arthur where Arthur had a dental pain. Uh, and, and that became identified with like, the kid understood that was pain. And then they used a doll where they would sort of say, oh, um, the doll has a boo-boo, ow, ow, on the shoulder. Or, oh, right here on the mouth, ow. Or, oh, on their head hurts, ow. And they would put a Band-Aid on the doll, ow, it hurts. And so by sort of labeling the doll, they begin to have this system of communication to sort of label where pain was. And so then when the kid, you know, looked like he was in pain, where's the pain? And they would bring the doll out and they, he could maybe point to where the pain was, or he could point on himself, head or shoulder. And they, and they developed a language for it. So they, for them, they use the language boo-boo, right? But it could be another word that we use. Um, so you need to develop a vocabulary and a method for identifying pain in certain areas of your body so that kid may be able to communicate better. Uh, we have two last questions. Uh, one is about wearing clothes in the house. Um, so his little guy doesn't, or big guy rather, I apologize, um, doesn't want to wear clothes when he has guests over. Um, and Me then- either. I hate doing that too. <laughs> now, now I need to censor you. Then the other one is around, um, toilet training for a five-year-old and um, any particular programs that, um, because when he also is demonstrating behaviors in regard to going to the bathroom. Yeah, I think it's, I think her name is Wheeler, 
W H E E L R Wheeler has a good book on toilet training through Future Horizons. Um, but the deal with toilet training, I don't know the specifics of this person's issue with toilet training, but you're trying to get them sort of desensitized to, to using the toilet if they have fears of that. And so often what we're doing is getting kids in a regular way to sit on the toilet, giving them a lot of rewards for sitting there, maybe even being able to use an iPad while they're sitting on the toilet, making the toilet just this incredibly enjoyable place. Um, and then, of course, the, the, you're trying to link the I'm about to go to the bathroom feeling with going to the toilet. So sometimes you can see when a kid is about to make a bowel movement or about to do something. Um, we, you know, kids sort of all of a sudden crouch behind a couch or something. And that's a time to zip your kid over and sit them on the toilet just at that moment. So they begin to sort of connect that. And they're also... Um, you know, uh, they may be afraid of falling in. So you might have to get a different seat that's smaller um, so they don't feel as scared of the potty, that kind of thing. Um, what was the other, oh, the clothes, the clothes. Yeah. So, you know, uh, fans, by the way, can be really helpful. Sometimes kids just feel very hot and uncomfortable in clothes. So we got to get around the sensory issues. Uh, my daughter certainly wouldn't wear socks even in the snow for a long time until we found that we could turn the socks inside out or get really fuzzy socks so the little seam wouldn't bother her. So look for look for labels and seams and things in the clothes that may bother the kid because he may have sensory issues. And so we're looking for sensory friendly clothes, but also consider getting a fan if, if being hot is part of the issue. Um, and, and in New York City apartments, can be very hot, right? Because we can't always control the temperature. So that may be part of the issue. If it's a lot cooler, he's maybe he or she's going to want to wear uh, clothes. Um, so, so that may help because it sounds like, you know, a, a sensory issue of needing, you know, a breeze and needing that open feeling or being hot or just having some discomfort with the clothes. So we might want to work with an OT on that as well. Thank you, Jed. And so we want to thank all of you for coming. Um, again, I want to really thank Dr. Baker for his time. Um, you know, this is being offered from the Office of Autism at District 75, and we really want to make parents aware of who we are and the services that we offer, because I know, um, you know, New York City is the largest school system in the world, and communication is not always the easiest to get out there. So we are making these uh, webinars available specifically for you after school, hoping that that would be an easier time for you to receive the information. Um, we will certainly be having more. We do have one more session happening next week on uh, Tuesday, December 9th at the same time. Um, and we will follow through. So remember, if I did put my email in the chat, if anyone did not get the information, please email me and I will forward you the flyer. Uh, if you feel that you know of any other parents that would benefit, um, please feel free to send that information out as well. And, and we really want to thank everyone for their time. Yeah, one quick thing, just as I, as I was reading, I, we don't reward our kids for going to the bathroom, like uh, completing a bowel movement or urinate. It's just for sitting there. It's just for being there. So they get used to it. Okay. Um, uh, that, that's part of the idea. Then, then eventually you can reward them for, you know, aiming into the right place. Kids, parents have put Cheerios into the toilet so you can aim and that kind of thing for boys. Um, so anyway. Last thoughts. Sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Baker, as always. Uh, appreciate your humor and your professional knowledge. Um, he sure is a hoot to work with and to know. Yeah. <laughs> and we, yeah. I, I truly value him. And uh, I want to thank you again for your time. Really appreciate it. All right. You'll let me know if I'm in trouble now, Mark. Thank you. No, it'll be me. Don't worry. All okay. Right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you, guys. Be well.